Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Brent. I have Vim. There is a diker running across the road. And we also have Zander, the only hipster in the Sabi Sands, with us uh, learning the camera ropes from Vim. And, uh, oh, exciting times for Zander. He will be shooting on camera this afternoon. Uh, you better focus and learn from the wildebeest. And of course, out in another part of the reserve is a James who's getting some exercise on foot with Herbie and a Jeandre. And in final control is Rebecca and Kirsten. Now, there have been cats everywhere. So we're not sure which cat we're looking for just yet, but we're gonna look for a cat. So I think what we'll do is we'll play the lottery luck game. So the first set of cat tracks we find, we'll follow. So we've got the, possibly the Incahumas, uh, a Birmingham Wall 3, Karula and Shongila and Hosanna, Tingana, or even possibly the sticks down in the east. So lots of cats to look for. Let's hope they haven't all decided to evacuate our traverse area. And I heard lions roaring, I think in this area, or maybe a little bit further to the south. It sounded like males, so it could be the Birminghams. So hopefully we can find them while they're still making lots of noise. Uh, it looks like quite a heavy cold front coming in from the, from the east. And it's about 13 degrees Celsius, which I've completely forgotten the Fahrenheit. About 50 something. <laughs> 53, there we go. Thank you, Rebecca. And remember, we are on the hunt live for the big cats of Juma, Cheetah Plains and Arethusa. And if you want to ask us any questions about how the cat hunt is going or anything about the particular cats we follow, feel free to do so by... Oh, there's a track. Was it a track? Or was I imagining a track? Uh, feel free to do so by sending us an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So it's a, the light's a bit bad, but there's a male line going down there. So this is where I did think I heard him roaring. So unfortunately he is heading due south, which is to the boundary. So I might track a little bit quickly this morning uh, to hopefully catch up with him before he leaves our traverse area. I would have guessed he was roaring right here. The last I heard. And yes, oh, thank you, Dina. Dina, the lion you saw roaring on the dam cam at 4 a.m. is the one we are following at the moment. Now, you see cub tracks. Oh, so it could be more. Them, of course, is uh, of the camera department, the best track spotter. He's like, he's like having an extra, he's like having a tracker. Okay. Oh, well spotted, Vim. Those are Karula's cub tracks, and those are from uh, a couple of days ago when it was a bit more wet. Now I'm just going to go this way, make sure the line didn't go here. Well, let's go see how James is getting along on Shank's pony. Good morning, good morning everybody. Uh, uh, we are talking to you from foot, obviously. You might see that from the angle that we are... Is that us? Hello? Are we on air or off air? Ah, thank you. Uh, just a message in our ear that said we were off air, but we are not in fact off air, we are on air. So hello and welcome to the bushwalk today. We thought we'd open up with some hardy dar ibis over there. Those are those two birds foraging across quarantine clearings and they have those probing long beaks. And what they're looking for is little worms and other sources of delicious nutrients that they might find under this now moist soil. So if we have a look here, I'm just going to draw a line with my stick. Although 
it is, well, not exactly sort of, a, I wouldn't describe this as a puddle. Uh, it's certainly, you can see some moisture in the soil surface here. And because of that, it was, I mean, was, this place was like cement until fairly recently. Because of this moisture, you'll find that the hardy dars have got some uh, sort of extra space to stick their sharp bills into the ground and try and find a few worms and other nice things to eat for the morning. I'm glad I'm not going to be eating worms today. We might try and feed Jean-Dre, who's on camera, some worms during the course of our walk. My name is James. There is the sun. That's that bigger, bright thing over there, Jean-Dre. You see it there? No. You see it now? Well done. And possibly the most important person on our walk today is the great Herbert who is standing to the left of your screen and he's going to be running security detail and also he's taken on the increasing role of bush and wilderness teacher during the course of these walks so he'll be telling us some interesting bits and pieces as we go along. So welcome. We are of course as live as Jamie uh, for as long as the um, earpiece tells me so which means we'd like to hear from you hashtag safari live or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to talk to us at all. So please do talk to us during the course of our little walk. We're just going to stand by here before we move because Taxon and his guests are going past. Good morning. I'm sorry, I missed Michael's, uh, Michael's uh, comment there, Rebecca, if you could read it again. The sun is really rather splendid. Oh, Michael, that's a new bird for your bird list. And you've just started it, and you say it's getting bigger every drive. Well, that's a very good thing, Michael. I'm most pleased, and thank you for keeping a bird list. I think it's quite a good thing, that. Um, <laughs> I'm not a huge bird list keeper myself, but I'm always fascinated by the numbers that people manage to achieve on Safari Live. I think our record is somewhere around 220 odd now. I mean, the total bird list for this area cannot be more than about 250. Uh, including vagrants and so 220 odd especially for a live safari when we're trying to shoot these things on camera is really impressive so Michael that's your goal I guess now our plan today is to head east into this beautiful rising Sun and when we get into well we're obviously not going to reach the Sun because we don't have a spacecraft we're going to keep that is pathetic we're going to keep going down through the Mawati drainage and sort of head around in a loop towards the south and then we'll come back slowly for breakfast around 9.30. There you might see the figure of Herbert who is discovering various bits and pieces. And just to give you an idea of what Herbie does, he's found something there for us. So he, he's not only looking for things to us to look for, he basically walks like the point man on a, um, a platoon patrol if you like. So he walks in a sort of arc in front of us and this we're on tracks and that's because I of course cannot keep my eyes entirely on the bush because I'm trying to look you in the eye as much as I can. What have we found Herbert? Aha! Aha! In Oh, Have a look here everybody. Herbert has found a very dead speak. Another few over there. Now what these things do is live in termite mounds during the dry season and the dry season is now and they've obviously been either they've probably come out as a result of that little bit of rain that we had and then they've been caught. Come and have a look here. There's three of them that have been eaten out. Tijain and another one there four of them. Herbie's not sure what would have eaten them. I mean this is astounding. So they would have come out of this mound and something has managed to get into them and eat them. And what's interesting is that whatever it is has not had to break the shell to get them. Except at the end there. Look at that. It's been cracked. It's been bitten off at the end. I suspect Badgers or hyenas, but I suspect quite strongly this is badgers that have taken the top off there. And that's just because I think a hyena would crush a small tortoise like this. So this is the Speaks hinge tortoise. Now what I want to see is if we can't, don't have a male and a female here. 
skeletons and bit of bone. I think those are both males. If you look here, you can see that's clearly concave on the bottom. The female's much more convex, and that's because the male, of course, when he mounts her, he has to, well, kind of sits on top like that, as opposed to uh, being concave, in which case he'd probably fall off and onto his back, which wouldn't be very good. So that's three of them there, and one of them here. A really uh, sort of large mystery. I think this is totally bizarre, especially as they haven't really been destroyed. I'm going to go with Badger for that one, but I really don't know what else could have eaten them. <laughs> um, Dina, you say would we use those shells or take advantage of them? Um, no, not really, because they obviously, you know, I mean, if you lived out here before, containers always something that is, is very useful, uh, but you can't really use them as a container because they're open on both sides. Um, I suppose people may have used the scoots for decoration. The scoots are the sort of um, hexagonal bits and pieces that uh, make up the different parts of the shell. But I don't know that they were ever used as... Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure they weren't used as decoration out here. We did have a fellow out here who um, sometimes wear, wears a tortoise shell as a hat. Um, but I think that's more for effect than for any sort of tradition. But that would be a leopard tortoise. Those are tiny. I mean, those ones are just, um, you know, they're a couple of inches across. So might make a baby's hat, but uh, not much in the way of a human hat. At least not a human, I mean, an adult, adult human hat. Interesting. <laughs> Wonderful Twitter handle, get off my cloud. You say, well, there are no badger tracks around there. Almost impossible to tell because that's not that's not freshly eaten, I don't think. So although I thought originally that they'd probably come out as a result of the rain we had a little while back, I'm not sure how freshly eaten those two tortoises are. So, you know, absolutely no badger tracks around there. Look at this tree, everyone. This marula tree, this great giant, which I think they're pretty fast growing. So I'm going to guess that this marula tree was probably in the region of 50 years old when it succumbed to the attentions of elephants. And what I think is going to happen, if you look over here, Rhonda, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing yourself around this direction. Thank you so much. Come on. Here we have a number of holes in the wood. And these have been drilled by wood boring beetles and woodpeckers and various others. And what they do is that they open up the wood to bacterial infection and to fungal infection. That will then eat away and rot the heartwood inside. And the next time we have a very severe wind or storm, this thing could easily fall over. And I'm sure many of you have seen us climbing about on those um, fallen marula trees just the other side of quarantine clearings. That's exactly what's happened. So the elephants open them up and they die. The insects get in there, the woodpeckers get in there, and then the fungus and bacteria get in there, eat out the heartwood. A big wind comes once the heartwood is rotten and they blow over and another giant falls creating a whole lot of habitat for various bits and pieces. And Anna Marie, you're hoping to see some ground hornbills. Well, I heard some yesterday while we were sitting with those lions and uh, their little cubs, and we didn't see them, but maybe we'll be lucky to see them today. Right, as we walk into the golden sun, let us head across to Brent Leo Smith. I'm not sure what his plan is this morning. I think he's going to head to Cheetah Plains, but he will tell you further of that now. So the real reason why marula trees fall over so easily is because they live in fear of James Hendry and his baritone voice. Uh, his, his voice just resonates and they fall over. Nothing to do with elephants, of course, and wood borer beetles. But, uh, so that lion did not cross our southern line. We've got tracks of another male lion heading into Juma. So my plans to go down towards the Cheetah Plains have taken a slight halt while I try to figure out the conundrum of the Birmingham boys and their movements this morning.
Good morning, Michael. Michael's wondering what happened to the Talala Pride. So remember seeing them on drives, but we haven't seen them for quite some time. Well, Michael, the Talalas are traditionally quite far to the south of us. And we saw them during the great turmoil of the Birmingham takeover. So when there was a lot of lion movements running up and down, lions were moving out of territory often. And that's when we start, sort of saw them because the Birmingham displaced the Matimbas who went down and uh, displaced the Talalas for a while. So it was just very interesting. It's, it was all due to male lions coming into an area that uh, the, the lion dynamics were, were quite confusing for a while. Everything settled down again. So the Talalas have headed back to their more traditional range around the Sand River. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Now, this is the last place I had tracks of a male lion coming south and tracks of a male lion going north. So, while we try to figure out the conundrum that of, of the Birmingham boys, uh, let's go see how, uh, how many marula trees James has managed to fell. That is uh, not in fact the bird calling, it is uh, me uh, trying to call the bird in the manner of our old friend Andrew Francis who used to talk to the hornbills. Well, he thought he did. I don't know if you can hear that. But on cue he called and then flew into the sun. He's only sitting, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight and a bit meters from us, which is, uh, well, that's not very far at all. It's about 25 feet. And he just sat perched up top there very comfortably. And Hornbills love doing that. And he's done it again over here. He's on the top of that tree there. And what he's doing there is just waiting for the sun. Hornbills love to come out onto these dead trees in the middle or in the early morning and warm themselves after a chilly night. Strange sort of graying, almost sort of a thunderstormish, um, thunderstormish sky continues to build over here and then it'll probably disappear again, I'm sure. But it does, uh, it does give the feeling of expectation, which is very nice. Now, Herbert has wandered off somewhere through here. I'm not sure exactly where. So let's see if we can find him. And if we find him, I've no doubt we will find a number of other, uh, well, interesting things. Here's something interesting. Sorry, jean it's just behind you here. You see the red here on this, what it is, it's a silver cluster leaf tree. Now it's been broken by elephants, but after, long after that happened, it was broken by elephants probably some time ago. Various animals have come to rub themselves here. I think this is probably buffalo where my stick and my finger are pointing now. But what you can see is the very obvious red color. Now that's tannin, and that tannin was used, um, I'm not so, so sure about this tree, but certainly the tannins that you found in the acacia trees used to tan leather. So you'd take that and put it on the leather and treat it after you'd taken it off your your cow, I guess, or even if you managed to find a buffalo and you needed some buffalo skin shoes. Now you tan the leather with this sort of thing, the inner bark of a silver cluster leaf. Then down here, I suspect that was probably buffalo as well, but also could have been impala during the rut. Now the impala rut finished to sort of, I mean, some of them were still at it uh, two weeks ago, but round about the end of May, the impala rut came to a close. But during the rut, Impala were marking bushes and charging them and uh, sort of shaking their heads through bushes to mark their territories and show how tough they were. And they would also have rubbed themselves on here. And I think they do that uh, with the buffalo specifically because they get itchy. The tops of their heads, I think, get tremendously itchy. And I don't think it's always territorial marking. And I think that in the case of the buffalo, and I have no, nothing to back this up other than my own thought, that those keratophages moths the moths that eat the keratin off the top of the horns, 
I think that they go, they, they lay eggs on the living buffalo and the buffalo then scrape them off. I'm sure they get ex incredibly excruciatingly irritating and I think they scrape them off and that's why you see old buffalo who've got such worn horns on the top. Yes, of course they fight a bit, but they also do a huge amount of rubbing and I think that takes the keratin off. Then when the buffalo dies, those eggs hatch and instead of being rubbed off, they actually manage to eat the keratin, pupate, and then they become the moths. I think that's what happens. Come, Jandre, let us continue. Hello, um, was it Austin or Awesome? Oh, Autumn. Autumn. Awesome. Hello, Autumn. Uh, that's a really nice name. Uh, Autumn, you want to know if anybody replants trees here? Uh, in order to sort of re recover the ones that have been lost to things like elephants. Uh, Autumn, no, the answer is no one replants trees here. And that's because we're in an open conservation system. And basically we let things, for the most part, just sort of take place and happen. So over the course of a human lifetime, a place like this will change profoundly. Over the course of, say, a millennium, so a thousand years, uh, it will change continuously and sometimes there will be lots of trees here and then at other times there will be no trees here. So if you have a massive drought, a prolonged drought, the elephants will come in, take out all the trees, that will open up habitat for grass. And so this might become a grassland for say 100 or 200 years. Then you'd have uh, maybe a prolonged time of wet season. Then all the trees will grow up again maybe, something like that. I'm just using vague examples and that will change the habitat again, say for 100 or 200 years. And so over the course of a human lifetime, um, it might seem like there's a, we, we, we need to replace trees that have been pushed over by elephants or you know, we need to try and stop change happening too much. The truth is though, we can actually have very little effect on an area like this over the course of the long term. So no, we don't plant any trees, we try and let things just happen as they would normally. Oh, have a look here. Here is where some elephants have been digging. Now elephants, especially at this time of the year, there's a back foot. Elephants, especially at this time of the year, everybody, um, like to eat, well, they, they like to eat grass if they can, but there isn't any grass. So now what they're doing is eating trees, and bark and branches, not many leaves left on the trees, and so they're going for roots. And this is quite cool because this is a plant called Mbezana, or Cissus cornifolia. It's got a foul smell. It's why it gets its Afrikaans name, which is um, horse's urine, Bartipus. And it does, well, I mean, it actually smells like horse's urine. But obviously the elephants have gone for the root system here. And we had a question, I think, was it from Michael, about how far the roots of trees extend. Sorry, Justin S. Just not Michael at all. Justin S. You wanted to know how far the root systems of these trees go. It's difficult to say. Um, I think something like this enormous combretum, which is quite old, or enormous silver cluster leaf tree, would probably have a root system that went from here. I'll just walk around where I think the root system extends. So it's quite large, as you can see there. I think that's probably the extent of it. But if you find something like a, um, a round leaf teak, which there aren't any around here at the moment, because they get broken up by elephants continuously, what happens is that the plant actually breaks in the middle and then it moves outwards. And so you can have one plant, one organism, that can extend probably for about an acre one plant, which so genetically identical sort of clones all over the place. Okay, we're going to head across to Brent. I, yes, I have no idea where he is at the moment. He's probably on some lion tracks or something like that, and we'll continue on our way this way. So, James is indeed correct. We have been following lion tracks. It looks like they've gone towards the east, so we're going to do the same. So we also get a double bonus there because it enables us to check for Karula, Tangana, Hosanna and Shongile. Now they're all 
we're all in that area off Ledwood Road and the lion tracks seem to be heading in that direction. I was really hoping that the lions were going to break the dawn with an awesome bout of roaring and Viam and I were quite excited to try to find them so we could get that incredible shot of the condensation coming out of their mouth as they roar. Good morning, Dave, in Toronto. And Dave's wondering, what is the furthest a male lion or leopard has ever migrated from their natal area? Um, I'm not 100% sure on male lions, but I know in places like the Kalahari, they do disperse massive distances, uh, a couple of, uh, up to a couple of hundred k's, uh, maybe 100, 150. Uh, but with male leopards, the longest dispersal ever recorded was a, a male leopard that was collared at, at dispersal age in northern Zululand, in on the, on the near quite near the coast, uh, at a reserve called Pinda. And over eight months, he dispersed into the Kruger National Park, which is about eight eight hundred kilometres. So, really impressive dispersal there. Of course, normally it's never that far. It's normally. Uh, between 50 and 100 kilometers, sometimes less than that even. Oh, I'm hoping the sun battles those clouds and winds. We've had some overcast days. I prefer the bright sunshine. One male lions give us a song. <laughs> Come on, please be what I think it is. Just trying to see what this is. It could be a. It could be a. An elephant, but it's on a piece of hard ground. But it could also be a, a drag mark. Now, wouldn't that be incredible? If we really made another kill so quickly and so close to the last one. Also gives us a chance to listen. I'm, I'm, I can't. I'm yeah. There we are. I escaped. So I just, it could be an elephant, but it's just, I just want to double check that it's not a drag mark. Okay. Unfortunately, it is an elephant. Darn it. I was really hoping it was Karula showing off with how good she is at catching impalalas. Eyes up, out and about. We're quite close to where Krula, Tingana and the cubs were yesterday. And there's always a possibility that they might still be quite close by. A 
those male lines seem to be general direction when they turned it was also this way Good morrow dispatch. Uh, dispatch is wondering how did the Birmingham boys get such a strange name? It seems so different uh, from the Inkahumas and the Sticks. Well, it's quite the story. Now, the Inkahumas, of course, named after a brown ivory tree, and that is the Shanghai name for a brown ivory tree. And the first time they were seen or found was under a brown ivory tree. The Sticks were named after the river Styx in Greek mythology because they sent so many creatures to Hades when they were in their prime. So they were a magnificent killing machine of about 13 lionesses many years ago. They're only three at the moment. They do have those eight cubs. Now, the Birminghams come from the Timbervati game reserve. And the reason they have the name of the Birmingham Boys is they were born to the Birmingham pride which resides on the farm that is called Birmingham and so uh, we're on Juma but the actual name of the property is Gauri uh, so so Sorry, just listening to the game drive there. Uh, so, this is where Karula and Tingana were. Ah, on the, uh, there we go. Let me just go for it. Birm has spotted a battle there. Let's see if there's any tracks there. So, there we go. There's the battle there. That's right above where the kill was yesterday. Taking the opportunity to just stop and listen again. Leopard. Look like Karula. <laughs> Yay! It's most exciting. Hold on. I think I spotted the queen. Okay, now the queen, of course, is in a precarious spot. I just want to see how to get around there. She was heading that way, so let's find a spot to get through. So there's a little river system here. Oh, everything. Where did she go? Can you see her? Yeah, I can. Oh, there she is. Hello, Queen. Karula. So she's probably left the cubs in the river system here and she's off hunting. And she spotted an impala. That's why she's using the drainage line. Stations located Karula, uh, mobile southeast uh, towards Ledwood Road. So I'm going to move the vehicle now, but there's an impala ahead of her. Probably a herd of impala at probably about 50 meters. Uh, negative taxi is uh, hunting. Okay, exciting stuff. Queen Karula on the hunt. I was just saying what a great hunter she is. And hopefully she'll make a kill close by again. And she's attempting to do that now. She's got the perfect access. There's this little ravine that is going to take her right up towards where uh, the Impala are. So we're going to stick away from her, not on top of her, so the Impala don't look at us and accidentally see her. So we're on Ledwood Road. We're a little bit further to the southeast from where we were yesterday. 
Okay, we're gonna keep still right here. There's Impala, right there, and there, and just in front of them, is this little ditch. Karula is somewhere in that ditch. Now those Impala don't know how close she is. We don't know how close she is. She could be almost on top of them. Now they're more Impala. You got it? Yeah. VM's got Karula. So she's still coming up the ditch. Oh, this is so exciting. You can see how she's using the terrain to her advantage. She doesn't have to crawl flat on her belly here because she's got this wonderful little ditch to help her. Lost sight of the impala now. Let me just move forward slightly. The impala is moving slowly away yeah. from her. Yeah, she spotted where they've gone. She's going to have to change her plan. They've moved away from her perfect ditch, but there's another perfect ditch. Look, 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 look at her go. She's going back into the ditch to go up the second ditch. Okay. Like I said, we're going to... Stay a little bit further away from her than we normally would. We're going to keep watching her. You got your eyes on her, Vim? Okay. Yeah, she, she's going right back down to the beginning of this little river. Okay. Hold on. You still got it? Shamsung says it would be amazing to see her make a kill. She's never seen a leopard kill before. Shamsung, it would be incredible. I've never seen a leopard kill live yet on Safari Live, but maybe this morning's the morning. So the Impala went that way. There was a couple of males chasing each other about. Oh dear. So what I think she's going to do, and she's going to go, she's gone straight back down the little gully. Now, where the kill was is obviously in a bigger gully around here. I think she's going to get into the bigger drainage system and she's going to move east towards those impala that moved into that area there. So what we're going to, okay, that doesn't look we can get through there. So I said we're going to try keep distance a little bit. We don't want to interfere. Hold on, Vim. Pretty sure Hosanna and Shungile are very close by as well. But we're just gonna sit here and wait for a little bit. I'm pretty certain she's gonna pop up. Expecting her to pop up right in front of us. Now, unfortunately, this is quite a difficult area for us to follow. Now, she might have abandoned that hunt and gone back to the cubs. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to go have a look where she was with the cubs yesterday. You spot something there? No, just having a look using the camera as binoculars. So 
she might even cross through and go up on the other side of this little river system to get to where those big herd of impala were going. So it's going to take us about five minutes to get back to where I think the cubs might be. Hold on. Now Gregory's wondering if Karula can smell the antelope. I think so, but I think what probably happened is she heard them. So there was a bunch of males there, and young males, they might have been playing, she might have heard the horns. Uh, or they might have been snorting at each other, as Impala do sometimes, especially the boys. So the reason I say she might have abandoned that hunt, I mean, she's got a full belly. Although Tingana did steal some of her meal yesterday. Michael Fleetwood. Michael is just wondering the fact that Karula and the Cubs were so close to Tingana. Does it mean he's the father? Uh, does it? Did he even know they were there? Did she mate with multiple males? Like all female leopards, she would have mated with multiple males. I know for a fact she mated with Tingana, Anderson, uh, Gajima, and I think another one. I'm not 100% sure because female leopards will move out of their territory to mate to ensure they try and mate with all the males that might, they might possibly come into contact with with their cubs. So the last visual we had of Krula was about here coming down behind this termite mound and this is where she had the cubs yesterday. So let's just have a quick look in here. Now as, as you know this is quite a precarious position or well, not precarious position but it's a difficult position to move about in. Uh, so, try, try our best. I've got a feeling we might have to do some serious searching. So, a very good comment from Francis. Don't forget to look behind you. Karula is very good at disappearing behind you. And I can't see the cubs just yet. Hang on. Oh, no, that's a rock. So while we keep our search on, uh, let's go see how James is faring on foot. Hello, everybody. I'm just staring at you through the eye socket of a Nyala. The Nyala, of course, is quite dead, quite deceased. And uh, some time ago, I suspect, Wonderful that Karula is in full view. Well, she was. Hopefully she'll go back to the babies and you'll have some time with them too. Now, this Nyala's nose has been eaten off, probably by hyenas, or I suspect by the lions. I suspect lions probably killed it. What's interesting to me though here is that the brain case has been left almost entirely intact. And as we have seen over the last little while, while well, we've been in the tent, these brain cases are extremely important little habitats for various different kinds of animals. In this case, I'm just looking inside. Shall we have a look there, Jandri? It's a bit dark in there, is it? Um, I can't see anything in there. No, there's nothing in there, Jandri. Just a bit of dirt, really. But they are quite important little habitats, and especially for reptiles. And especially this time of the year, they'll go in there and estivate, or just sort of kind of go into a temporary hibernation. Quite a large brain this Nyala had. And I've read that something like a horse has the size of a 
has a brain the size of an almond or a, a peach pip. That's not true. This is a, I mean, this is a nyala. Nyala is substantially smaller than a horse, and its brain is about the size of a sort of tennis ball or a squash, I suppose. Well dead, long dead, and all the keratin has been eaten. Amazing that it can be eaten by anything, especially as it's totally indigestible to any mammal life. So that would def almost certainly have been eaten by insects or beetles. All right, so that was a nyala. Come on, Jandri. Let's see what else we can find here. We haven't found much heat, I have to tell you, everyone. It's been very cold around here. There, is, there was, I believe, Steph walked through here the other day and showed you the carcass of a giraffe. And this is the, the, some of the remnants here of the giraffe carcass. This will be a fairly substantial bone. And not even the hyenas can get through a bone like this, which I think is quite interesting. But look how it's been smoothed there. You see that? Now, that calcium, I suspect, has probably been eaten off by porcupines. Porcupines have an extensive calcium need because they are constantly replacing their quills. Also, you'll find tortoises coming and chewing on these things, but that's probably mainly during the summer months. Now, I don't know that that's particularly new damage, so it could well have been tortoises. That's quite heavy. That bone is probably about 5 kilograms, which is a... What's that? That's 11 pounds. Very nice. Jandro, do not misbehave or I shall thump you with that bone. Sorry, Rebecca, you're going to have to go with that again. Robin, you had a question about animal brains. Oh, do predators eat the brains? Absolutely they do. They love the brains if they can get at them. That's why I think that may have been a leopard that, um, I said lion originally, but may have been a leopard that killed that nyala. Certainly wasn't a hyena, because the hyenas would have got into the brain case, almost certainly. And I think lions would too. So I think it may, may well have been a leopard that killed that nyala. Because otherwise I think the brain case would have been done. Have I got a bruise or dirt under my eye? That's a nyala brain. Oh, some nyala brain. Sorry about that, everybody. Is it gone now? There we go. <laughs> Hello, Shamsan. Um, you're wondering about Nigel, the decomposing nyala that we put in the little uh, sort of box of uh, flesh-eating beetles the other day. Uh, I don't know, Shamsan. I haven't checked him since I got back from leave. Um, I suppose I should. Um, I'm just a little bit reticent to go and open up the box and see what we're going to find. But I think that Nigel is probably well on his way to being cleaned or picked clean by those beetles and then we'll put him together quite nicely and hopefully have him in the tent for when we next have a tent. This is a stunning, stunning day as the light filters through here and we're on the banks of the Mlorwati drainage line and if you look around us here you can still see that there is some greenery, you know. Although it looks very dry from afar when you get in here uh, the trees on the banks of the drainage still have quite a lot of leaves on them. And that's tambuti trees, it's jackalberry trees. Jackalberries are the, the big green ones that we can see over there. And they're what we call semi-deciduous. So they will lose their leaves, but at odd times of the year. And then they're... Not many of the trees here are edible to the animals. Jackalberry is obviously very tall, nothing's going to eat that. Tambuti trees have got very poisonous leaves for most animals. Hello Betty Sleep, you're wondering about the tannins in trees. Um, you say do they produce the tannins and then flush it out of their systems and then repeat the process? I don't think they flush the tannins out of the system so much as produce a burst and then that burst will kind of dissipate. It probably goes into the air and is probably digested by the... Um, digested is quite a strong word. Broken down in the tree. I don't think it flushes the system out of them, no. But I think you'll find it will remain for quite some time.
And Xranga, you're wondering about native trees for timber that we find out here. Well, I'm standing on one now. Xranga, this is something called the silver cluster leaf, which you know obviously very well. You've been watching for a long time. Silver cluster leaf is, um, is termite resistant. And so this is a really good timber tree for, uh, for planking. Then the jackalberry is also known as an ebony tree. And commercially, I believe it was harvested at one stage. Over there, that's the jackalberry tree there. And that produces a very beautiful ebony kind of a wood. But, you know, so many of these trees, in fact, most of them are very slow growing. And if you're ever around an area where there are elephants, they don't grow straight. No, almost no, none of the trees around here will grow straight because of the attentions of the elephants. And so they don't really make very good planking trees. So to make furniture and bits and pieces from the trees out here, uh, you've almost got to plant them in an area where there aren't any elephants and then wait a very long time. So, yes, I mean, of course, people have been using the wood out here for years, but planking it is often very difficult. And so it's not particularly used uh, for timber. So none of the commercial plantations that we have out here are native trees. They're almost exclusively Australian or, uh, or pine trees from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, up in the rainforest of Africa, sort of around the Congo and um, Gabon, the, in the Congo Basin, they, they do they harvest commercially trees, normally unscrupulous, um, often French and Belgian companies come in and take timber from those areas. It's an extremely unsustainable practice. I mean, it happens in the Amazon as well, doesn't it? But it certainly happens up there. And because the controls and laws are so much more difficult to enforce, it's really easy for unscrupulous business operators to take those trees. And that, that's where it does happen. Not so much here, though, because the trees just don't grow in the same way. I'll just quickly show you um, I think Brent is still trying to find Karula, so we will go back once he's done that. Here again, you can see the tannin on these trees. And this is the knobthorn tree. Ooh, we're in for a bit of a treat here, Jandri. See the shiny bit there? You can see it? Jandri just made a slight grunting noise. I'm not sure if that means he can see it or he can't. Let's see if he'd like to taste that. Andre, would you like to taste that? Mm, and? Mm. He says it's quite nice, you see. <laughs> the best bit is this here. You see the inner bark here. So that's the outer bark I'm just removing. This kind of white inner bark here. There we are. That's delicious. Well, I mean, look, it's not, it's not right up there with the best, but it has got a sort of chewing gum-like effect, and mm, this particular one is very bitter. That's very odd. But if you find it on, it's normally much nicer than that. Maybe it's because it's a young tree, because of all the tannin, you see. Um, but you can find it <laughs> much much more tasty on the red thorn. Let's go across to Brent, who has refound the leopard. Well, it is not the leopard we initially saw. It is Mr. T dozing, and I've just seen Hosanna as well. Um, but we can't really see him, he's moved into a bit of a thicket, so I'm very short. Sure young Shongile is around as well. And just behind him to the right is the remnants of that impala that Karula killed. Oh, oh, it looks like he might pop onto visual view. Hosanna looking at Tingana. Um, he's literally straight over my head there, through there. Um, he might pop out. And where are you now, little, little rat? Come on. Well, I'll keep an eye on him uh, if he does pop out into the open. And uh, Tingana's actually spotted him and is looking at him. And you can see there's not much aggression there. Just more watching. Now we'll try to get into a position just now where we can maybe see both. I wonder where Shongile is. I think Karula's continued on hunting. 
She's got cubs and Tingana to feed at the moment. She's got three children. Okay, there we go, Vim. Here we go. Hello. Naughty. It'd be fascinating if he came and tried to share the kill with Tingana. I have heard a report of Tingana sharing a kill with uh, Shadow's little one. Oh, he's growling. That, that ends that. You stay on that side of the drainage line, little, little man. <laughs> Tingana is probably obese with the amount of impala he's eaten, and he still doesn't want to share. You can just hear those growls. Now, Asana is sneaking off and back down the other side of the termite mound, away from Tingana. So Michael, there we go, that answers your question. He's definitely aware that the, the cubs are here. I think it could also just be individual leopards' personalities. Mvula was very playful with cubs. Um, there we go. Three leopards so far. Hopefully we find Hasana, I mean Shongila, and make it four. That elusive five leopard drive is avoiding us, and that would be equaling the Safari Live record. Five leopards in a drive. Deja Vu Breakspear would like to know, how do you spell Karula's female cub's name? Uh, and what does it mean, please? Oh, my spelling is not, not very good, but I think I can remember how to spell Shongile. It's X-O-N-G-I-L-E, Shongile. And it means exquisitely beautiful. Oh, back to snooze for the big man. Just trying to see if I can see the cubs again. Nope. I'm keeping my ear open to see if those impala start alarm calling and uh, see if Karula's hunt is going to be successful. The area she's hunting in will be very difficult for us to get near. Just very thick. And well, we've got at least two leopards in the hand, probably three. And there's some beautiful golden light come, about to come through. Okay. It's... See if we can move a little bit forward, possibly have a, a view of young Hosanna and keep a lookout for Shongile. So, while we sneak forward through here, let's go have a look at what Tingana's footprints look like. That is what uh, Tingana's footprints look like, everybody. Um, they are roughly the size. Let me put my hand there. I just don't want to fall into the mud. So nice to have a bit of mud around. Of course, this is only a result of the rain that we had. There is my hand. It's not a particularly big hand, but it is at least twice the size of Tingana's hand. So nothing like the size of a lion's. And although sometimes we do c confuse male li or female lion tracks with very big male leopard tracks, um, really, if you see them next to each other, you can't, you can't make the mistake. Shape um, is almost exactly the same as that of a lion's track, but 
uh, the size is just profoundly different. So he came and he had a drink here. Now we've often been asked, what on earth do these animals drink and how do they manage to drink the stuff that they drink here? Well, I mean, you and I certainly wouldn't drink this water. Uh, you might, if you were really desperate, try and sip it, but you'd probably get very sick. A, because of the buffalo dung and various other dungs that are sort of are almost implicit in these pans because the buffaloes will come and sit here during the summertime and so the soil around here will be filled with their dung and the back associated bacteria. But also because of the silt and the mud here, it'll be very difficult for any kind of animal other than the predators to derive sort of nutrients from the water here. The lions and the leopards don't seem to have any issue at all with the most muddy, foul, befouled water. Buffalo don't seem to mind too much either, but it's mainly the lions and the leopards that I've seen very happily drinking water like this, and that's what Tingana did here. Quite interesting too that he was drinking water because leopards are not water dependent. They don't have to drink water. And so I think it's just quite interesting that he's taken it upon himself to have a drink despite the fact that it's been pretty cold out here. Maybe it's got to do with his injury. I'd be interested to see um, if Brent has managed to see him stand up and maybe his injury is fixed. I don't know. Anyway, let us continue on our way. Very nice. That I, I think it's just fascinating that uh, Tingana is sitting there with his kids. Look, I know he's not being particularly nice to them and he's not sort of sharing his meal at all, but I, amazing that he, he should be there. And jean -Dre said to me earlier today, do I think that she would have left the cubs with him? And I said, no, I really didn't think that he would have, she would have at all. I would have thought that um, he'd have left by now and that was the only reason that she wouldn't be with the cubs now. And yet again, the animals out here have proved me completely wrong. So let's go back to the leopard cub and their dad. Go. There he is. I think it's him. Let's have a quick look. Could be her, but I think it is him having a snooze on the opposite side of the little river system from Tingana. It could very well possibly be his dad. The station's there. Uh, we found the uh, Kurilas Montuan, I've got a visual of one, uh, visuals one out of five, but also Tingana is still in this position on the Nyama. Okay, so yeah, he's, gonna, he's snoozing there. Now I'm pretty sure his sister must be somewhere in that area as well. He's moved back from where he tried to sneak up towards Tingana and got growled at. So he's put a bit of more distance there. So Got there's Tingana, you can just make out a rosette through the thicket. We're going to reverse back to where we have a better view. Now, the one fun thing about moving around in these little river systems is you get to do the 28 point turn. See him, he, he's not even fussed about us. Hey, mister. Oh, oh, oh. I thought I heard alarm calls. Can you hear them? Jim, can you hear them? Just listening. Doesn't sound like Karula's hunt was successful. Sounds like she's been spotted. Just trying to listen for, for any slight or something that she might have been successful. Okay, he's heard it and he's listening as well. He's going, come on Karula, give me another free meal. Yeah, well, he's being flat and not too entertaining. 
I think let's go let's try and get to where those alarm calls are and then we'll definitely come back here. Um, how much space have I got, VM? Oop, oh, I've caught a tree with the jack. As I said, in these little areas, it's the 29 point turn just to get out. So if she has been unsuccessful, it's going to be interesting to see whether she comes back or she decides to continue on hunting, leaving the cubs close to Tingana and this impala carcass. So it's not too far, unfortunately, I know a little open area that should get us right up there. And that's why I think the Impala were heading to feed. And it's very similar to the spot where Karula caught this Impala. So this is the little open area where Karula caught that impala that Tingana is sitting next to. We had a look at where the blood is and where she actually did the takedown yesterday. Now, this is a little seep line and after a little bit of rain, there's a bit of green grass. So you're finding a lot of animals like impala uh, and so on are frequenting these areas. And it's great for a leopard because she's got good cover coming up towards the seep line. Listen for a second. All's gone quiet. Not a snort in the air. Let's just go have a bit. So if she had been successful, we would probably hear a lot more snorting. So from where the snorts are, it's the head of a bark. Three or four of these little river systems, or they join to make the big one where the kill is. Now, Dina is wondering would Tingana take a kill from the cub, such as that scrub hair kill yesterday? Uh, he most certainly would, uh, Dina. Leopard and lion societies are incredibly patriarchal and the bigger you are, the more you can take. I would have said those impala were around here. As you can see, this is one of the reasons why I didn't try to keep following Karula. It's just river system after river system and Timburti thicket after Timburti thicket. Well, let's head back down towards the other leopards. Maybe she's heading back towards the cubs. Maybe she's going to move them. Um, or maybe she might try to take her kill back from Tingana. You never know. Now, Justin S. would like to know could you possibly train a leopard to hunt for you? Um, 
Firstly, Justin, I would like to say, I don't think I'd ever want, want to. I, I don't know whether it's possible. What traditionally happens out here, or used to happen out here, is that if you find the drag marks of a leopard and you're a hunter-gatherer or someone who lives out here, all you have to do is run towards the leopard and it will generally run away and you can steal its kill. I, I, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to train a leopard to hunt for them. I would reckon it's probably a bad idea. It's a wild animal and that wild animals belong in the wild. And what also happens with wild animals in captivity, you think they are tame till one second, you fall funny, you trip funny, and you will get munched, literally. Oh, there we go. Right in front of me, well spotted right there. It's Karula. So the kill's just there, so we've got Karula, Tingana, and the Cubs all in the same area. So she's made her way back, possibly to try to see if Tingana's moved a little bit, and she can probably sneak in there. Hello, Queen Karula. Now she's watching Tingana. <laughs> Anna Marie says that we should get knighted for spotting the queen. So, Sir of all the beast and Sir Leo Smith. What do you think? How's that sound, VM? Or Zander, Sir Zander. Count the beast. <laughs> oh, is he going to have a snooze? Now, I'm going to sit here while she's sneezing. I'm hoping she might call the cubs to, to her or if she moves back towards that carcass. I can actually hear a cub calling. You hear that, Vim? Ow! Ow! Maybe she just wants a bit of alone time. Kids these days, you know, well, so dad's, demanding. Dad's babysitting, so why bother? Yes, there we go. As Vim says, dad's babysitting, why bother? Oh, has she heard something else? Is she off on the hunt again? This incredible hearing that a leopard has. You can see how her ears are picked up. Now she's right on the edge of the seat line, so there's a strong possibility lots of different animals might utilize this area during the day or at night. Keeping quiet to see if we can hear what she's heard. Now she's looking back in the direction of where we last saw the cub. African fish eagles in the distance. Now isn't it fitting that exactly six months ago Andrew and myself found these cubs when they were a few hours old and Thank you to Ellen for reminding us that it is their six month birthday. And Madame Carilla is going back to sleep. Obviously, whatever she heard didn't warrant any activity or physical movement. So, why not enjoy a snooze? Oh, 
almost want to whisper as not to disturb her slumber. Now, if Kula had had a successful hunt, James Richard is wondering, would she have done anything to try prevent Tingana from taking it again? Um, she might have done some snarling, hissing, and maybe throw a few blows, but he's just that much bigger than her that there's very little she can do to prevent what she could probably hope is he would eat his fill and then maybe carry on on his territorial patrol. If he heard Gajima rasping, he would set off to try sort him out. But you must remember, even though she's an incredibly good mother and good hunter, she's still mostly an instinctive animal. So the fact that the Impala were there, even though the Tangana was right there and might steal the kill, her instincts took over and she went to try catch that Impala. Okay, Stephanie's spotted something. Vim, can you zoom in there for me, please? Somewhere there, there is a wart or a tick between her shoulders. Stephanie, I'm probably 99.99999% sure that there is a tick. Let's see if we can find one quickly, Vim. Um, you get a couple of different species of ticks. The ones that look like warts are large, fat, and gray. Um, I think just currently in her... Oh, come on. Where's a, where's a tick? Oh, we'll keep looking for a tick. Uh, hopefully we might be able to see one when she moves. Oh, there's a tick. Um, just below her eye. It looks like a tick there. Oh, we're at full. Yep, that's it. That's it. Okay, so it looks to be a little tick there. We will keep... We'll try to show you a bigger tick later, but I'm sure it's not a wart, but just a tick. So once it's full... It'll drop off. So while we wait patiently to see what happens in this incredible sighting of four different leopards, let's go see what James is up to. I'm slightly distressed that the most entertaining thing going on at Karula's sighting of uh, two cubs, a female leopard, male leopard, are ticks. Anyway, ticks can be fascinating, can't they, Jean-André? jean, -Dre? jean -Dre squashed one the other day and uh, the blood flew everywhere. It was very disgusting indeed. Right, come and have a look over here, everyone. What we have here is an interesting track, and I'm not going to tell you what it is to start with. I'm going to ask you to try and interpret it. Uh, we can see where my stick is moving, if jean just sticks on where my stick is. This is the tail of whatever animal this was. You can see it moving up down through here. Then you can see some excavating. There's some excavating there over to the front and here and here. Now the question is what was this thing eating because that will tell you what it was. Another little bit of excavation here and then I think it wandered off there. Now while you think about that I'm going to show you something else uh, and then I would like you to tell, give me your answers. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv The tree above us is a Balanites tree or um, torchwood and the torchwood fruit is supposed to contain a flammable oil, which I have never managed to light, and I'm not going to try now. You got jiwa? I just said, that's it, but is it edible? Because I didn't think it was. I thought it was toxic. It's poisonous, hey? And so I was about to eat it, then I thought, no, hang on a second. I don't think you, you should eat this. And it is, it's toxic. And what you can do is you can put it in water and it'll actually kill fish. So if you've got a small puddle of fish and you want to try and catch some of them, you can kill the fish with that. And now I can actually feel the... Oh, smell that, Jandre. Hmm. It's a bit like a sort of apricot, but a kind of poisonous apricot, I think. Um, I wish I actually had had brought some matches with me because I think that's what, it's the oil and I can feel the oil on my fingers. I think that's what burns and that's why it's called a torchwood. Because I've tried to open up the seeds which are supposed to have an oil in them and I've always embarrassed myself every other time. Anyway, 
That's the torchwood tree, and this is it here. The green thorn it's also known as. Right, well, I'm glad I just checked with the Herbert there. Right, any answers for uh, whether, what this track is? Who said that? Michael. Michael, you're absolutely correct. Thank you, Michael. You said it was an artfark. It was an artfark that came along here. That's an ant bear. Big fat tail. Animal is about, poof, they probably weigh about 35 kilograms or so. Maybe up to 50, a really big one. And that's 110 pounds. That would be unusually large. But they've come along here and what he's doing is he's not excavating, he or she, is not excavating termites. They're excavating ants. And in winter time, they eat more ants than they do termites. And I think what he or she has found here are signs of some kind of ant burrow may well be associated with this torchwood tree. And that's what's being eaten here. Isn't that nice? I think that's quite interesting. Let us continue. Herbert has found something here. Come, Jean-Dre, do not dally back there. Herbert's just up front and he's waving frantically at me. Well, not very frantically. Herbert doesn't do anything frantically. <laughs> very pleased that I didn't just stick that in my mouth. Andre may have had to carry me and the, and the backpack home. Although, given how I treat him on these walks, he'd probably have left me. Hello Boyd, you're in North Carolina and you want to know if any of the plants here have medicinal uses. Uh, Boyd, just about every single plant out here has been used for, as a medicine for various things at some stage. And I'll, I'll go through a few of them shortly. Now, look over here everybody. There is what many people would consider the vilest form of invertebrate here. A centipede. Look at that. You see at the bottom there, Jandri? You got him. Now, the centipedes like to live in the darkness underneath the logs. And many of them have got a very nasty bite that is extremely painful. It's not particularly uh, dangerous for human beings, but they can bite. And it's something to do with their movement that people really find quite disturbing. And I, <laughs> I find them... I find them fascinating, but also kind of disturbing at the same time. And they, they're predatory, so it'll be looking for things like wood lice, perhaps termites that have come to live underneath this, rock, this log, especially during the summertime, at least during the winter time. So, you know, many things will take shelter underneath a log like this. And then we've got even more over here. What we got there, Herbie? Ah, one of these amazing sub log baboon spiders. Here it is. You see it there, Jean -Bri? That's one. There it is. There, and it's a. It's part of the tarantula family, and they normally live in subterranean nests. But these, this particular species, likes to live under logs. So that's what that is there. What they eat, I'm not sure, but almost every single time we found one of them underneath these logs, what we have found is also one of these things here. Now that may be because they share habitat. It may also be because this is what the spider is eating. And that is the exoskeleton of the olive burrowing scorpion and it's a well it's a highly toxic or highly venomous scorpion but that's just the exoskeleton the actual scorpion has long absconded now I think it's far more likely than rather than the that the um, rather than that the Try and say that on a cold morning, Jandre. Rather than that the spider has eaten the scorpion, I think what it's done is outgrown its exoskeleton, crawled out of it and just left it there. But often found in association with those 
amazing baboon spiders. Just look at the colours on that baboon spider, really amazing stuff. I think someone called African Princess, is that correct? Wants to know what my favourite bug is. Crafting Princess, there we go. Crafting Princess. <laughs> you want to know what my favourite bug on these... I'm assuming you mean an invertebrate, so something that isn't a mammal or a bird or something like that. I think these baboon spiders are absolutely fascinating. And we had one uh, during our big cat, um, not our big cat, our, our Father's Day weekend, that had been paralyzed by wasps. And so we got some really good close-ups on them. And I found them absolutely fascinating. I'm not going to pick this one up uh, because A, it'll harass it. And B, because some of the baboon spiders can be slightly venomous to human beings. Um, not the ones that we find in the holes. That's the ones that we managed to show you during the, the Father's Day weekend special. But I think these subterranean ones could well be slightly venomous to human beings. But most of them, like the tarantulas, if you put them on your hands, they're very, very relaxed indeed and they don't bite you. Very nice stuff. Right, let me return this log to its original position. <laughs> Try not to squash the spider. There we are. Exactly back where it was. Kirsty, you're in turn Tennessee and you want to know if anyone would like to eat that, um, that centipede. Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, you get a snake called a centipede eater. They um, specialize in eating centipedes, but I think you'll find birds will eat them. I've certainly seen woodland kingfishers eating centipedes. They love to catch. I found a woodland kingfisher once. In fact, the last one that I saw at the end of the summer season was eating a centipede about six to eight inches long, and it was just beating it against a branch again and again and again. And I watched it probably for about 20 minutes beating this thing, breaking up the exoskeleton, possibly, um, you know, I don't think the centipede was still alive and it did it for about 20 meters and I think it was to break up the chitin in the exoskeleton and then it swallowed the thing whole. It looked uh, like a great big gray disgusting dangerous slug. I must confess there's very little out here that makes me go <laughs> but uh, the centipede is certainly one of those things. Let us go up here, jean and get a, a view. And also, oh, I was hoping there were going to be some termites and a bit of warmth coming from this chimney stack, but it's been closed up on account of the fairly inclement weather. So you can climb up to very little height in this area and get a pretty good view for quite a distance because it is a pretty flat landscape. Anyway, you can see the weather really not fantastic at the moment. And the sort of brightness of the morning has been taken away by the greyness of this front coming through. Anyway, still a lovely day to be out. Let's go back to the sleeping leopard. We're going to continue off towards the west. Well, a huge welcome to Synthidians in Johannesburg. Synthidians is a school and we've got the grade one class with us welcome guys and look at this there's a female leopard having a snooze right next to me my name is brent and you're on safari live school drive oh she's a tired kitty so this is our dominant female so it's the female leopard we see the most of she's got two cubs that are hiding behind us and there's also a male leopard here so there are four leopards around us at the moment and while she's having a snooze, let's move down and see if we can see the other leopards. So I'm really excited, and I'm sure James is as well, uh, about answering your questions. As I said, uh, my name is Brent, and if you have any questions, 
give them to your teacher and I'll see if I can answer them for you. So we're really lucky this morning. It's not often you have four leopards in one sighting. Normally you just see one at a time. Okay, so we're gonna try head down to where there's an impala that this female caught yesterday and the male has now stolen the kill from her. Okay. And of course, to bring you these wonderful pictures, I, I, I have not one, but two cameramen today. So we have Vim and Zander on the back, who are bringing you the wonderful pictures and making me look good. Okay, hi Sharu. Sharu is wondering how much does a leopard eat? Now a male leopard eats on average about eight kilograms of meat a day. Now it doesn't eat every day. It eats some, normally every two or three days, sometimes every four or five days. But if we average it out, uh, about eight kgs a day uh, and uh, female probably about four and a half or five so that female there weighs about 35 kilograms the big male we're about to see once i hopefully don't get caught in the thorn tree it weighs a, probably this guy's quite big he probably weighs close to 80 kilograms all right gotta watch out for the thorns lots of thorns on here Yeah, I also don't want to hook my cameraman. You good? Okay. So Jack's wondering, can a leopard swim? Now, Jack, they can, but they don't like to. Okay, look at that. There's the big boy. Hello, Mr. T. His name is Tingana. The female's name is Karula. Now, Tingana is our dominant male here and he's having a snooze as well because he's got a nice full belly. So if we look just off to the right of him, uh, there we go, in the bush, you can just see some fur and some meat. And that was an impala that has been killed by the female and stolen by the male. Now I'm just looking around carefully all around me because I know there are also two cubs close by, but I'm not sure where they are at the moment. Now, big cats sleep a lot. So they sleep about 18 hours a day. Caden has asked a very good question. Caden would like to know, why do some animals hunt at night when they can see better during the day? So animals like lions and leopards have very good night vision, probably about 20 times better than ours and they only see in black and white but the reason they hunt at night is because the impala and the other animals can't see as well as they can at night so it gives them an advantage also uh, the big cats need have very a very big problem when it comes to getting too hot so if they get too hot they're unable to do anything so we're at night times cooler and enables them to be more active but even then, they're not that active. As I said, they generally sleep for about 18 hours a day. Not quite as bad as lions, who sleep for 20 hours a day. I'm just trying to see. The cubs were sleeping close by, but I can't see them at the moment. We might move just now to have a look if we can see any of the cubs. Now, also... And we've got to keep watching to see if that female leopard comes down to join the male leopard. Matthew's wondering when is the best time to look for animals on a game drive? Well, Matthew, early morning, just around sunrise, and then again in the late afternoon. So it depends what animals you're looking for. But your big cats and your hyenas, that's the time when they're moving. During the middle of the day, it's quite hot. 
and they don't like to move. And also during the dead of night, sort of around midnight, they also have a snooze. Look at that, you can see how pretty that boy is. So when you live in the bush like we do, we wake up at the moment at about 5.30 every morning. So you've got to be up early and to bed early if you want to live in the bush. Zachary's wondering what is my favorite animal. Zachary, my favorite animal is the African wild dog. For me, they're the most exciting to follow and they're always busy, not so sleepy like this leopard. But I like all the animals, Zachary, from the birds to the bees, the leopards and the lions, the elephants and the buffaloes, and also all the bugs. So guys, I've just got to talk on the game drive radio quickly. Oh no, he's talking to someone else, yay. Now, one other thing that we look at quite a lot of that a couple of you might get a bit grossed out about is dung. And I'm going to let James tell you all about dung. Hello, everybody, especially the kids at St. Stithian's School. Now, I was not at school at St. Stithian's. I was at school at a very small stone school, quite a long way from St. Stithian's that many of you will know of. Um, quite a lot, uh, quite quite a lot older than St. Stithian's. Anyway, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. And you can see that I am lying in amongst a whole lot of dung here. Now, there's a saying in English that goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, my name is James, for those of you who don't know. And why would you know? Because I haven't told you yet. And you are welcome to ask me any questions about this dung or anything else. And it's the same out here. One man's trash is another man's treasure. One animal's dung is another animal's food or even its home. So we've got a number of different kinds of dung here. The first thing is this elephant dung over here. This is a big piece of dung here. Now listen, before I carry on, just remember, if you ever go into the wilderness or into the bush, don't fiddle around with dung unless you know exactly what it is. If it's a herbivore's dung, so the dung of an animal that eats grass or leaves, well, then it's fine to pick it up and play with it because, well, it's just not very um, unhealthy. But a carnivore's dung, you all know what dog dung smells like. It's not very nice, is it? You'd never pick it up with your hands. And so we don't do it with lions or with leopards or with wild dogs or with hyena dung. So this is an elephant's dung, and you can see how many different kinds of things this elephant has been eating. Look, he's been eating leaves. See? Some leaves. He's been eating sticks. There you can see some sticks that he's been eating. He's been trying to eat grass, but there's so little grass in here. There might be a little piece of grass, but I think that's actually a piece of bark from uh, a tree. And the best thing about high of that elephant dung, ah, is the smell. It smells so very nice. I know you don't believe me, but it really does. If it's not fresh, it smells delicious. Now, then, also, if you look in the middle here, remember I said one animal's dung is another animal's home. Here were some termites living. They were eating the dung and they were living inside it. So everything out here is some kind of home or some kind of food. Now, Robert, you want to know what the difference between this and rhino dung is? Well, Robert, we don't have any rhino dung around here, but rhino dung, Robert, basically is much darker, it's blacker, and it's only got grass, if it's a white rhino, because white rhino don't eat uh, sticks, and they don't eat leaves, they only eat grass. If it was a black rhino dung, then you would find leaves in it. But you wouldn't find sticks like this. You wouldn't find bits and pieces of tree. You wouldn't find things like that in a black rhino's dung. You'd only find leaves because they eat leaves. So it's much finer. It's much less big pieces. Now, there are two or three other kinds of dung here. Now, these two are quite special. That, and you see it's uh, what we call an irregular shape. It doesn't really have an obvious shape. And I'm sure many of you will have a guess at what that is, and I'm pretty sure you'd all be wrong, I'm afraid. That's warthog dung. Now, a warthog 
Uh, it's not really like a normal pig, because a normal pig, you wouldn't want to pick its dung up. You know, they eat just about anything. A warthog is a herbivore as well, and they eat grass mainly, and bits and pieces of underground grass material that you can find underneath grasses. So the roots and what we call rhizomes, but you don't need to remember that. That's what they eat. And then, that I'm sure many of you would have seen before. It looks like a horse's dung, doesn't it? And it's a zebra's dung. And you can tell that because different from the um, it's different from the warthog's dung because it's got a crack in the middle. You see that little crack in the middle? Every piece of zebra dung has got that little crack in the middle of it. And zebras only eat grass. And then I've got one other special kind of dung here to show you. See this tiny little piece? That's called a scrub hare. Now a scrub hare is kind of a rabbit. You know, you see how it comes out white like this? A scrub hare does something that we call coprophagy. Can you all say that together? I'm going to count to three, then you're going to say it. Coprophagy. One, two, three. Coprophagy. Now, coprophagy is when you eat your own dung. Now, thankfully, of course, we don't have to do that, do we? But rabbits do that. And what they do, the first time it comes out of their bottoms, they eat it straight from there, but it's this kind of slimy pellet. And then the second time they do it, it comes out as this dry ball, like this. And the reason they do it, it's quite a good reason, is that because they eat only vegetation, it's very difficult for them to digest the food and get enough nutrients from the food that they eat, so they have to kind of eat it twice. And it's a little bit like a cow or a buffalo or an impala, which will eat the grass and the leaves and then they vomit it up into their mouths and they reach it and they swallow it again. Again, very happy that we as human beings don't have to do that sort of thing. Okay, let's carry on our little walk. Now I'm on foot here. Uh, jean -Dre is on camera. And, ooh, there's some interesting things here. Also on the ground here, uh, well, over there is Herbert, and Herbert is tracking for us, and he grew up here, so he knows more than anybody about this area. Now, I'm going to answer your question, Mayor, shortly about water, but first I want to show you two interesting things here. Here is a track, and if you you can see some very sharp claw marks. See that? Now, those claw marks there are from a hyena. Now, what was this hyena doing? This whole area is a big storybook, and if you're skilled like Herbert is, you know how to read it. And Herbert teaches me and jean -Dre basically every day new things about how to read what we call the bush newspaper. So that is a hyena, but what was it doing? And if you look over here, now this, is, this wasn't recent, this is quite old. Here you can see another track of an animal that has no claws. See that? No claws? And that was a male leopard. And what's happened here is that this hyena was chasing the male leopard, quite possibly because the male leopard had something that the hyena wanted to eat. So, while we've been talking about a male leopard, let's head back across to Brent and see if he can show us more of those incredible leopards that he's got with him. So, of course we can show you a male leopard, although well, no, he's still having a snooze. The only thing he's doing is flicking his ear to try to keep biting flies off him. Now, I've been looking carefully for the little cubs. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try and move a little bit to where I last saw the cub. And maybe we'll get a glimpse of one of the cubs, or hopefully even both. I think I can just see a cub. Let me just move around so I can get a, a view for you guys. I think I can just see a few spots in a bush. Okay, so we're gonna go around and okay, let me go a little bit more to the left. 
and center of the screen. There we go, in that little bush there. And right in. Okay. There it is. So we just need it. We'll get the focus on it now. It's quite difficult in there. Okay. Sorry, guys. Hang on. We just have a camera malfunction. We'll sort it out now. That's the thing is we are live, so we can't control to the left. There we go. Right there. Okay. Just let's get focus. Okay, just sorry guys, we're having the camera seems to be stuck. Um, we're just trying to fix it now. Okay, a little bit to the left. There we go. We've got. Okay, now can you see that little white spot? On the, the there we go. That little white spot there, just to the left of the center, is it looks like a leopard cub tail. I did see it move. Hopefully, it moves again and gives us. And you can see the spots now. Uh, it's see how good its camouflage is. Now, I'm hoping it moves, but that leopard cub, if you see the big stick in the center, there's a little white spot above it. And if you go to the left of the big stick in the center, there's two branches going upwards. And just behind those branches is where the cub is. Vim, if you go slightly to the left, okay, now center of the frame. There we go. You can just see the, the the spots there so obviously that's not the best view of a leopard cub we will hopefully get a better view of it shortly but and we'll go back to the big male um who's sleeping over there and and chloe's wondering how we know the difference between a male and a female leopard well chloe a male leopard is much much bigger now I'm just trying to see, there we go, we can show you a bit more of the kill from here. So if we go into the bush here, the male leopard's lying right there, but you can just see the impala, a little bit to the left, there we go. There we go, there's the impala kill. There we go. You can just see the impala there. Isn't that... That's a nice meal if you're a leopard. Not so nice if you're a human. We prefer our meat to be cooked. Okay, so let's move on. We're going to go double check what's happening with the others. Um, hopefully one of those cubs pops out shortly. And or we get to see mom again. Just trying to reposition here. Tamir is wondering what is the difference between a leopard and a cheetah? Well, a cheetah is taller than a leopard, but it's not as heavy. And one of the really easy things to tell the difference between a leopard and a cheetah is if you look at their eyes. So I'm going to show you a leopard's eyes because we've got a leopard next to us. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a cheetah as well? Wouldn't be nice for the cheetah because leopards are much stronger than cheetah. Make sure I don't fall into a big hole. There we go. So there we go. There, the big male leopard's head is up, so we can see his eyes. Now, if we look carefully around his eyes, you can see that it's pale under his eyes. There's a pale stripe there. Now that's to help catch all the light around at night. So oh, big yawn! You can see those big teeth, and that means. A leopard does most of its hunting at night. A cheetah has black, almost looks like tear stains around its eyes, and that means it does most of its hunting when the light is up. So leopards are nocturnal. Cheetah are not truly diurnal, which means during the day. Oh, here comes another yawn. Oh, look at those teeth. And those black tear marks of the cheetah uh, help it 
to diffuse light. Now, this is a very big word, but it's the word for, oh, he might eat a bit of the kill. Is he going to drag it out of the bush for us? So we can see nicely. Nope, he's going to lie with his back to us and eat the kill through the bush. So back to the cheetah. So cheetahs are crepuscular. Now I imagine that's quite, it's a very difficult word to say. Crepuscular. And that means they like to hunt in the early morning and the late afternoon at dusk and at dawn. Crepuscular. So, hi Dean and Nozel, and they would like to know how long I've been a game, game ranger and what is the best part of my job. Well, I've been a game ranger since I was 18 years old, so, oof, I've got to do some math. Uh, so, 15 years, and I've been lucky I've grown up in the bush. So, I've been living in the bush since I was younger than you, and... I was always going to be a game ranger. And that's been, and what do I love? I love it all. I love being able to sit this close to a leopard while it eats its kill. I love finding leopards on foot. I love tracking. I like birds. It is incredible. Um, I just got to be on the game drive radio in a little bit to help someone else find these leopards. So we talk to all the other cars here, and if we find something, we all tell each other so we all get to see them. Okay, hang on. So while I talk on the game drive to try to figure out what's going on, James has found a fascinating crime scene to show you. I'm at a crime scene, everybody, and I'm bouncing around on a very, very strong piece of buffalo. It's a buffalo rib, and it's so strong that it can hold my weight. Now, come over here, jean and have a look in my hand. Oh, what I had in my hand, everybody, has escaped. It was an amazing beetle. And here it is. Here it is. You see it there, jean -Dre? Just next to my finger, there's a beautiful starling-coloured beetle of green and blue and a bit of black. You see him there? And he's just moving along. And I think that he was eating, I've seen a few of them around here, I think they're eating the last little bits of meat that are left on this buffalo. Now, the crime scene that we were talking about See here? Look, all around here a whole lot of bones and mainly the rib cage, these incredible strong springy ribs of the buffalo. And the buffalo was by a whole lot of hyenas and what they did was steal it from some lions and they dragged it through here and they put it in the shade and why would you think they would have put it in the shade? I'm going to give you two minutes to answer me why you think they would have put it under the shade here. Remember it's winter, it's not hot, so it wasn't for the sun. Why would they put it under the shade here? And here they ate it and remember the bush like I was saying to you earlier, it's like a newspaper. Um, it's got lots of things to read about it. And this is exactly like a crime scene. Many of you would have seen crime scene shows on TV and they figure out who killed who and how it all happened from an area just like this. We know, of course, what happened here because we actually saw it. Uh, we saw the lions killing the buffalo down there and then the hyenas stole it and they dragged it all through here. There were 12 hyenas, and I'm not sure how many lions there were, but an amazing sighting was had. So, that's the story over here. Why do you think they put it underneath this tree? Now, Taylor, while we're thinking about why they would have put the carcass under the tree there, you want to know if 
oh, dung beetles only eat elephant dung. No, dung beetles just about eat any kind of dung, including some carnivore dung, which smells disgusting, like this carnivore dung over here. So dung beetles will, some kinds of dung beetles will even eat this. Now, I'm not going to pick this up. Can you see it's green? Now, there's only one carnivore that has green dung, and that is the hyena. And when it gets exposed to the sun, this hyena dung will go white. It'll go a plain white color. So that's quite interesting. That's hyena dung. Remember, Taylor, there, you know there are probably about 900 species, so 900 different kinds of dung beetles that we get here. So they eat all different kinds of dung. Let's just go back to the tree here and think about why it is that they would have pulled it under here. Remember, some of the major scavengers of this area are vultures. And vultures find kills and carcasses by flying up in the air and they look. But hyenas are not scared of vultures, so they don't want to hide it from the vultures because of the vultures. But if vultures see it and vultures start circling and they come down and land, lions and other hyenas from all around the area will see the vultures circling, same as we do as humans. We watch vultures, and when they see the vultures coming down to the ground, they'll think, oh, there's meat over there, and they'll come running over here, and there'll be a big fight over the buffalo. And so that's why they put it under the shade, so the vultures can't come and find it and tell all the other animals where it is. Right, let's keep having a little on our little walk here. Hello, Rian. You're wondering if I've ever been charged by a wild animal. I have once or twice, Rian, um, but you must understand that that's normally because I've been very stupid. So, animals out here only charge us human beings when they are afraid. And they are afraid of us because I know it doesn't seem like that often when you see a lion or an elephant or a buffalo, but animals are afraid of us because for many, many, many hundreds of years we've been hunting them and so they're scared of us. So if you make an animal scared, then it will charge you. And so if I ha have been charged by elephants and sometimes buffalo and my one or two lions, it's because I've made them scared and that's not what we're trying to do out here. Out here, we want the animals to be completely comfortable with us. So when I get charged by an animal, I don't feel, yay, that was exciting. I feel, ooh, I've made a big mistake and I've made some, something, I've made an animal upset and so upset that it's decided to chase me. And that, so it makes me very sad when that happens. And Herbert's just showing us over here an amazing track. Look at this. <laughs> look at this. Now, look, I'm going to put my hand in the middle there. See my hand? Same size as the track in the square. This is the square track of a lion, a big male lion. And what's interesting here is that you can see the claws. Now, many of you will have house cats at home, and you know that your house cat doesn't have claws all the time. Only when they stick their claws out do they have claws. Now, a lion is the same. Now, why do you think that a lion would stick its claws out? Well, the same reason. It's very soon at the Rio Olympics because when he wants to run very fast, he wants to grip onto the ground. And so when he's just walking, he doesn't put his claws out. But here now he's chasing hyenas. I think they're probably chasing them off that buffalo. And so he stuck his claws out into the ground so that he could get grip and run along like that. Now, it was quite wet here, but it hasn't been wet here at all during the dry season. And Maya, you've asked a very clever question about whether we give water or not to the animals out here. Maya, we do in some areas. So we do pump what we call pans, uh, which is a natural sort of uh, a bowl in the ground where we put water and then the animals can come and have a drink. But we don't have to give them a lot of water. And that's because they don't need to drink a lot of water out here. They're adapted and that means that they've specially designed to living with not very much water. They can live with much less water than we can, Maya. Right, that's going to be it. So as I told you just now, they've been hiding uh, the carcass from the vultures over there. I think that's all we've got time for with you kids. So I hope you have a very good day at school. Let's head back across to Brent.
so we've managed to get into a spot where we can see the little cub. So that's the one we we're trying to find. So we did some off-road driving and we can see that's the little male cub. There is a little female cub. I'm sure she's sleeping quite close by. We can't see her at the moment. And this little guy's name is Hisa Hosana. And you can see how incredible his camouflage is. So if we zoom out, he'll just disappear. Look at that. And he's gone. So a huge, huge thank you to Synstidians for joining us on this school sunrise safari. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope we'll see you on safari again soon. Remember, you can watch when you're not at school. And isn't this a nice way to spend a, a lesson? I think I wish I got to watch game drives when I was at school. So from myself, James, and the rest of the Safari Live team, um, we'll see you soon, hopefully. Bye. So thanks very much for sitting with us through the school drive, guys. It is so important to develop the future conservationists of tomorrow. And there we go. We managed to get into a spot where we can just see Hosanna. He's still watching Tingana, uh, who has dragged that carcass into an even more terrible place for us to see. Karula is still lying up just near there. We'll probably go make our way back towards Karula in a little bit. I just want to see if we can find young Shongile around. So I'm just going to sit quietly here, watch around us, and see if the little female makes an appearance. It looks like he's looking longingly at was what was once his impala kill until Tingana claimed it. Oh, look at that face. Isn't it just too sweet? Now, even though Tingana believes he could be the father, uh, Shamsan would like to know, would he ever harm or kill the cubs? Uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, Shamsan. And Tingana's actually got a bit of a reputation for eating cubs. Uh, as far as I know, he's eaten about five or six different cubs uh, since he's moved into the northern Sabi Sands. But so far, he seems to have calmed down as he's reached, as he's become a bit older, doesn't eat so many cubs. And... Uh, and he's been seen now with both Shadow's cub and with Karula's cubs, and he hasn't, apart from a couple of low growls, sh showed too much ill intention towards the cubs. I don't think it would be wise for them to try going anywhere near that carcass, though. That might not end well. Oh, heads up. Well, we're going to leave little Hosanna in his thicket. And I think we'll go back and sit with Karula. Uh, she might get up. She might go hunting. So let's, let's get back there. And you're going to get to come on a, a bit of an adventure with us. And so we're going to have to go through quite a steep little area. So Michael's wondering how much of the kill, oopsie, I nearly, nearly lost a camera operator. Uh, Michael's wondering how much of the kill did Karula and the cubs eat before Tingana arrived. I would say they'd eaten already about half of it when we left at the end of the sunrise safari yesterday. Um, here we go. And uh, yeah, I would say probably half, maybe even a, oh, 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 come back here. Don't steal my blankie, thorn tree. Um, so probably about, about half, maybe even a bit more than half, before Tingana arrived on the scene. Tingana was on Chitwa Chitwa, which is to the south, during the sunrise safari. So he, he it's difficult to say, I found something that I lost yesterday. Now, to stop the high lift jack 
rattling, we have a bungee there. So what I'm just going to do, and sometimes, of course, because we do off-road through some thick bushes and stuff like that, we lose bungees, but it's always really excited when we find one again. Yay! Here we go. VM loves bungees. They're his favorites. Bungees, third favorite. Third favorite. VM's favorite things uh, are, are cable ties, um, gaffer tape or filming tape, uh, and then bungees. Now, we use them for everything. Uh, the VR rig is held together with a combination of, of, uh, of cable ties and bungees to stop the jack rattling. We've got bungees. We've got cable ties everywhere. Now, you always know if VM's been on, on a vehicle with you because the cable tie... Oh, I got the angle of it wrong this time. Okay. They're holding on. There we go. And we're going to go through a... There we go. Through the... Dip. And then again, operating in these areas, it's the 28 point turn. Gives, gives us good, strong forearms. Okay. So, here we go. We'll show you. There's Tingana eating over there in the thicket. There he is. Unfortunately, he's not in the best position for us to view with his back to the most accessible spot. So let's go see what Queen Karula is up to. Now, if any of you are new and happen to accidentally just stumble upon us, we are live. So when I say live, I mean literally you're about to watch me go through a thorn bush with my arm on a live African safari and there are four leopards around us. There we go. That's why it's always good to have thick jackets and we can use them uh, to get through some of the thicker areas. Now, Sally's wondering, see this is nice, this is a, a toilet paper tree. It's so soft in comparison to what some of the stuff we have to deal with. Oh, she's moved. Has the queen gone? Ah, she's moved not too far. She's moved closer to where Tingana is. Okay. So, sorry, sorry, Sally. Uh, Sally's wondering: Do the cubs have a, a way of getting to Krula um, without going past Tingana? Um, they'd have to go past Tingana, but um, if she wanted the cubs with her, she would go to the other side of the, the drainage. Uh, it's hard work having lots of little cubs jump on you all the time, and especially when you've got to keep them fed. Okay. And we might be able to actually see Karula and Tingana from one spot. So she's just looking down there, so I'm doing the same, seeing if I can see any impala or anything. Hmm, I wonder what she's spotted or heard. And there is the queen. And a very regal pose. Come out a little bit wider. So, wait, there's my hand. There's Kula. Tingana's in that thicket. We can't actually see him from here, but I can hear him crunching on the bones. Now, she's moved about four meters from when we last saw her. Oh, big yawn. Oh, beautiful. And it is excellent that she's spending more time within our Travis area. And as the cubs have got bigger, she seems to be bringing them 
and spending more time on Juma, which is of course excellent for us. Now, Ellen Fowler would like to know how far is Karula from Tingana in the cab? So, Tingana is there, probably about 15 meters away, eating in that thicket. The cubs are, are probably a further 15 meters on the other side. So, she's probably about 30, 35 meters from the cubs and about 15 meters from Tingana. Ooh. the beautiful queen of Juma. And we can hear some noisy arrow marked babblers in the distance. Very aptly named bird. Now, Karula is staring at the moment directly at where Tingana is, or oh, was. Oh, back to Snoo. Back to snoozing. Um, Felicity is wondering, is there some sort of behavior that Tingana is showing that makes her know it's safe to keep her cubs there? I'm just going to side forward a bit. Try to get you guys a view of Krula as she naps. There we go, that should do it. So Felicity, I will back to your question now we just got ourselves into a slightly better position um, here he is curled up in a little fur ball so felicity probably the fact that he hasn't tried to eat them <laughs> might reassure um that he's he's far more concerned with the carcass than actually trying to chase the cubs is probably the most reassuring there we go See, even though that she's snoozing, watch her ears. They do move from time to time. If she hears a noise in a certain direction, try to figure out what that noise is, whether it's worth investigating. Quite peaceful here with the queen. Distinct, I can still hear Tingana munching away. So when we sit here patiently to figure out what's going to go or wait to see what's going to happen next uh, James has got a spiral horned I don't know to show you seems to be day of the Nyala for us everybody these two are mercifully in much better condition than the other two we've seen today uh, which were inescapably dead there are two here inescapably alive and two bulls that have taken to a life of bachelors, they're living free of the uh, sort of troubles of the family. Uh, that, of course, is totally normal for Nyala. And we just disturbed them here. They were clearly feeding on some of this last sort of greenery along the drainage line, and they're heading off there. And I think they'll probably spend most of the day doing exactly what they were doing here, just feeding along the fringes of the drainage. Now, we did hear an elephant in here somewhere. 
and we were hoping to try and get a view. If you're going to view elephants on foot, obviously you need to do it from a position, ideally, where they don't know that you're there. There are some parts of Africa, specifically a place called Mana Pools, there are actually three Nyala there, where the elephants have become so used to and so habituated to humans on foot that they will actually approach you and kind of sniff your breakfast cereal and then move on and that's fine. In this area it's not quite like that and so if you are going to view an elephant on foot this is a great place to do it because you've got a view, you've got some cover if you want to get behind it, the wind is good, I'll show you what I mean by that, we're watching, there we go, straight into poor old Jandre's face. Anyway, it does mean that if the elephant is down below here, then it won't smell you. But mostly, you've got some height. And while an elephant could definitely come up here very easily, it's just it's much easier to move away off a height like this than it is if you are lower down. So that's why there's a good position to try and view an elephant from. I can't see where he is. I can't hear him anymore. Herbert's gone off there to have a look. So we'll follow him. Our, state, our picture is quite unstable. We're going to try and follow Herbie. Um, if it doesn't work, then we'll probably have to go back to Brent. Watch out here, Jean-Andre. You can hear, maybe, you probably can't, um, but there is a, a grey go-away bird gang. <coughs> you like that, Jean-Andre? That was a really good impression, in my opinion. And it's doing that because it's seen us and it's a little bit alarmed by the presence of the apex predator over here. And the Nyala is still watching us quite carefully from through there. He doesn't know what we want. Very concerned. And as those kids were asking about earlier on, have I ever been charged by an animal? And it's just, it's a continuously amazing thing to me how terrified of us animals are. I mean, if you corner a Nyala, it will absolutely take you to pieces because it'll see no other option. But out here in the open, it's completely terrified of us. It won't let us get close, despite the fact that it's stronger and faster and more agile than we are, and yet it still has this unbelievable fear of the human being. And that, of course, is why it's relatively safe to walk in these areas, if you know what you're doing and if you're relatively aware of what's going on around you. Astoundingly, the signal seems to have held, which is wonderful. There's Herbie up top there, just here having a look. Just having a smell and a listen. That's quite interesting. Dina, nice question from you about elephant teeth. You say you know that they have multiple sets of teeth, and do we ever find their teeth on bushwalk? Um, do we find them in their dung? Um, no, we don't. Now, the reason we don't, Dina, is because when the teeth are replaced, oh, it's gone around the other side of those nyala. So to them, it's going to feel like they're being stalked. There they go. They have taken off at an Unbelievable speed. <laughs> Herbie didn't realize they were there. And so quite by chance they found themselves sandwiched between two predators that they're terrified of. And they took off unbelievable speed. Uh, sorry about that, Nyalas. That's actually not great to see, but it's not really our fault. We didn't do it on purpose. Um, Dina, when an elephant loses its teeth, it doesn't, they don't fall out, they wear down. So when they're replaced from the back, by the time the new molar is fully in place, the front one has disappeared completely, so you wouldn't see that. I have seen elephant teeth. They don't fall out, though, so you only ever find them in the bottom jaw of an elephant. We don't find many jaw bottoms of, from elephants because they do get dragged away by hyenas when the elephants die, and also because the elephants often die close to rivers and their bones tend to end up in the river systems. And so we don't often find elephant jaws, but their teeth don't fall out of their um, skulls like ours do. Nice question that, Dina. I've never thought of it like that. We just say that elephants lose their teeth, but we don't often explain how that happens. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Look at this. 
This is a potato bush, everyone. Now, it smells like McDonald's potato chips or crisps during the night, and during the day it doesn't smell of anything. But it's these little bits and pieces here. Can you see the kind of copper red flowers and buds? It's those that smell like potatoes during the night. Now, this has been eaten by various animals. I suspect those Nyala have been having a go at this. And obviously the greatest damage we've seen is caused by elephants. And not, um, the name is, is amazing to me, so I'm going to have to get it again. Hang on a second. Elu Nyabi. Not heard that one before, have you, Jandre? It's not a common name, is it? Elu Nyabi. Elu Nyabi, you want to know how big an area an elephant will destroy in a day? That's not a question that's answerable um, for two reasons. The first one is that elephants don't destroy areas. It's, we've, we've got so used to using um, negative terms when we talk about how elephants operate in an area. They don't destroy areas. They do break trees, but that's creating homes for other animals. It's creating habitat for other trees. It's creating habitat for other plants. So while it looks destructive, especially if we look over here, for example, this looks like complete destruction. Um, it isn't. This is creation as much as it is. It really depends. This is the second reason I can't answer the question too accurately. It depends entirely on the size of the elephant and on the season. At this time of the, the year, the elephants will break lots of trees. In the middle of summer, after a huge amount of they won't break any trees at all. They'll only eat grass. So the best way to answer it is to just say a big elephant bull must eat probably about 660 pounds worth of food every single day. So that's quite a lot of food. So however long, you know, however much that takes uh, is how much it will destroy. Okay, we're going to continue up here and see if we can't find that elephant. And while we do that, let's head back across to Brent and his sleeping kitties. Well, the queen has not moved a muscle since we've been gone, so we're just sitting here patiently, watching, waiting. And just waiting for the other vehicle to move. There's only one spot to look at Mr. Tingana, and even then it's not the greatest, so we might go try, have another look in that spot. Because the queen cooler is having a schnooze. Head up. Head up. She keeps looking back there. I wonder if there were some impala snorting in the distance. I wonder if she's considering trying to go have a hunt. I must imagine it must be quite frustrating to lose your kill to male leopards. Now, I have seen male and female leopards share a carcass before, but I've never seen Tingana share a carcass. I can't hear any bone crunching at the moment, so maybe he's gone back to snooze and I wonder will Queen Karula try to sneak in there and steal the carcass back. I have seen leopards do that before. Ears up, but eyes are closed. Just listening to see if I can hear Tingana munching. I can't. There can't be too much of that carcass left. Oh, 
Nat back to snooze. As I said, we're just waiting for the other vehicle to move out before we go back down towards Tingana. So just to let you know what else has been found out there this morning, there's an Nkuma lioness mating with a Birmingham boy. I'm not sure which one, but they are to the south, uh, southeast of uh, Cheetah Cut Line. I'm pretty sure there should be an Nkuma or three still on property somewhere. That's amazing. Our lion hunt quickly turned into a leopard morning. Uh, Megan's wondering why a leopard doesn't need to drink water. James was discussing it a bit earlier. Well, they get enough moisture. Uh, and you must remember, I mean, a human being is 70% water. So when they kill and eat something like an impala, they're getting enough water from, uh, from that carcass, from the blood, from the organs, from the meat. And what they do do, if there is water available, a leopard will always drink. It's, it's, it's a bit easier. But if there isn't, they are able to survive just on the, the blood. Oh, Egyptian geese making a noise overhead. Ah, ah, ah. They have disappeared. They went that way. So they were a bit, bit, bit fast there. They were flying at high speed. Okay. Now... We're going to still sit here with Kulo. We're just waiting for that vehicle to move out. Uh, and then, oh, we will. Well, while we wait, there's, there's a bird. Let's go around it. And it could be a night. Oh, of course it flies away as we turn all the way around. Okay. So you can hear the vehicle. And it's quite a tricky spot to get in and out where Tinganda is. And we're lucky, we've got a short wheelbase vehicle, so it's a bit easier for us to maneuver around uh, in these drainage lines and thickets. As I said, I'm not hearing any bone crunching at the moment. So let's have a look at Kulo. Her head's up, but her eyes are still closed. Oh, eyes are open now. tired kitty. So luckily I think Kula and the cubs did manage to eat probably a little bit more than half of that carcass before Tingana stole it. Okay, it's nearly time to move and go have a look uh, at Tingana again but James has stumbled upon the creature he was looking for so let's go have a look. I haven't really stumbled across them so much as Herbert very skillfully listened and then found them. It's a herd of elephants and as I was saying to you earlier, it's always nice to watch them from a bit of elevation and some cover. We're standing on the top of a very large termite mound. They are approximately, oof, I'd say about 75 meters away from us. Uh, that in feet is about ooh, 180 to 200 feet away. So we've got some good space between us and them. The wind is blowing straight from them towards us, which means they won't smell us. Um, I'm in grey, which is a very good colour to be out here. Chandra is in khaki, which isn't the best colour, but it's not bad. And so even if they were to look up here, because of the cover between us and them, it's unlikely that they would see us. The eyes are not bad, uh, probably about as good as ours, but I don't think they'd see us because they wouldn't be looking for us. And likewise, if they were to see us, they probably wouldn't react too negatively. If the matriarch was feeling threatened, uh, she might sort of take a few steps towards us, in which case we'd just disappear over the back of this termite mound and abscond into the bushes. And that's basically the best way to view elephants. So probably about eight or nine of them, I am guessing from the sound there. You've got a youngster there, that you can see and another big one moving into view now. 
The other thing this height does is provide us an opportunity to see exactly where they're moving. So that before anything untoward can happen, well, we can actually see exactly where they're going and what the direction of the herd is. Isn't that nice? There's something very profound about being semi-exposed to elephants like this. It's calming at, in, on one hand, but on the other hand it's kind of whew, it just makes you catch your breath a little bit, which is great. You know you're alive and uh, want to remain such, not so Jandre. Jandre's shaking his head, he's not sure if he wants to remain alive, but I do. I know I do. Hmm. a nice question from you that is nice because it doesn't have an obvious or simple answer. You say, are there any other animals other than, say, rhino, which we wouldn't want to habituate to human beings on foot? Um, no, I don't suppose there are, Ekshranga. I just think that it's not possible with some animals. You know, lions and leopards... Leopards will, t will habituate to people on foot to a certain extent, and so will lions to a certain extent, but they're always going to remain wild. They're never like... Um, like You've seen elephants around the vehicles where they totally ignore us completely. They just carry on and go about their business in the same way that the cats do. You can get to that stage with elephants in some areas if you're constantly around them on foot, but you, you will never get that way with a lion. You'll never be able to walk up to a, a, a lion pride and sit down in amongst it and it'll just ignore you. That's never going to happen. Um, it's bit not in a wild area like this. So it's not so much a question of not wanting to do it because it would be very nice to be able to walk people there, but at the same time, it's it would take away, I think, from the wildness of this if all these animals were so completely used to us on foot that we could just walk in amongst them. And I think it would make us slightly less... It would be very nice to be able to walk people there, but at the same time, it's... It would take away, I think, from the wildness of this if all these animals were so completely used to us on foot that we could just walk in amongst them. And I think it would make us slightly less, perhaps, respectful of being out here. So, no, we don't really want all the animals to have that kind of habituation to us on foot. There's a chap called Kim Walliter who operates in a place called Mashatu, up on the Botswana, the corner between Botswana, Zimbabwe and South Africa. And he's habituated a hyena clan there to the extent that he's able to sit at the den. He does. He sits and he writes his blogs with the hyena cubs playing around him. It's an amazing thing to see. And in an isolated incident like that, I think that's cool. I think it's fine. I wouldn't like to do that with all the animals here because it would just it would start to feel a little bit like a zoo, I feel. They have no idea we're here, these elephants. They're just trying desperately to try and find enough food to eat. Now, Elu Nyabi, I think you're a new viewer, and it's wonderful to have you with us. So thank you for sending first your question, and now your second question. Or well, just before I answer it there, we've just been spotted. See that one with its ears out, Jean-Dre? I think she spotted us there. See how she's opened her ears? She's scratching her ears and listening. She's not threatened, but she's just indicating that she has seen us. Now, we are 200 feet from them, so we're in no danger here. But that, that, indi that thing that she's doing there with her ears is saying, I've seen you, and I'm not that comfortable. She'll now tell the others around her if that threat to her feels um, substantial. I don't think it does. She's still kind of flicking her tail normally, but she's most certainly spotted us up here. The rest of the herd is just carrying on. She's the oldest that I've seen so far. 
Isn't that interesting how she's watching us? And also interesting to me is that she has not lifted her trunk to us, which tells me that she's aware of the way the wind's blowing. She knows that if she lifts her trunk to try and smell us, she's not going to smell anything. I think that's incredible. So just to reiterate, we're in no danger here. They're not very threatened. She's just become aware of us. That's all that's happening there, and she's letting us know that she's aware of us. So we're not in any shape, way, or form going to try and engage in some sort of Red Bull extreme experience here. We're just going to view them here, and if it looks like she becomes even slightly more threatened by us, we'll move away. So while we wait and see what happens, Elune Ayabi, you want to know who the leader is or what? You'll find there that that's the matriarch, probably. And she's gathering now the others towards her. There's a little one, two little ones moving towards her. And I'm sure that she's spoken to them very quietly. So the basic, now we've been spotted by another one, the basic social structure is a matriarchal society where the biggest female will lead the herd. Not the biggest, the oldest female will lead the herd. This is just fantastic. They'll be talking to each other very quietly with the low rumbles that we are unable to hear. Now, Kevin, just before we move off this uh, mound here, you want to know what would be the best course of action were an elephant to charge? Um, again, depends how close you are. So we, if she turned around and started coming this way, we would just go back off the termite mound. If it looked like she was serious enough, we'd make Jean-André drop his pack and we'd just walk off quickly there. They're moving off now. So they've obviously decided we're too much of a threat and they're not happy about it. That, that makes me sad that that's happened because I, we were watching them and it was all so calm and so nice and obviously they are threatened by us and so they've moved off, which is, which is not ideal. Ideally we should have moved off before that happened, I think, but we couldn't tell when it was going to happen. All right, wonderful sighting. Let's head back to the Leopard and Brent. We're going to head slowly back towards the north. So we've tried to get you a view of it. Tingana uh, eating, he's actually eating the skull of the impala now. So I think it's a relatively, maybe last year's baby, or, it, or an adult now by this stage, but I can't see any horns. So he's actually opened up the brain cavity. Probably they do that with the smaller antelope. And the brain is a very nutrient rich meal. I can hear some more impala snorting in the background. So there's lots of impala around here and hopefully one just meanders into where Karula's lying. It is possible. Uh, I'm just gonna maybe try, if we roll back a bit, and we have a slightly better view. See if I can find a little window through the bushes. No, I think where we were was best. Maybe a bit further forward. Okay, you can see where his paw is. That's the ear. And you can just hear that bone crunching. I'm going to keep quiet. piece of bone. <laughs> I'm 
So they've been quite lucky the hyenas haven't discovered them yet. Now there's a couple of reasons why the hyenas possibly haven't discovered. The first is that there's still that elephant carcass that the hyenas are all feasting on in Buffel's Hook. And secondly, the den is literally on the opposite end of the property. Oh, it's even off our property in the Manuleti, but uh, where the main denning area for the hyenas here at, at Juma is, is literally on the opposite end of the property in the northwestern corner. We're quite close to the southeastern corner. Just trying to see if I can, if we're going to get a view of the pubs from down here again. And unfortunately, oh, there he is. So he's popped up into the open. So he might be a better bet than Mr. T at the moment. It looks like little Hassan. I didn't have a great look. Franklin coming right towards him. Okay, so he's in the exact same spot he was earlier. He's at, he spotted the Franklin. There we go. There he is. Oh, there he is. He spotted the Franklin. Look at how flat his ears have gone. So the Franklin's no more than about a meter and a half from him. I wonder if he's going to make a pounce. Franklin's just beyond him. Could he chase that unsuspecting Franklin into his sister? Oh, no, he's decided napping is more important than chasing birds. Oh, Mr. Hosanna, you got me so excited there for a second. Now, that Franklin still didn't spot him because we would have heard the alarm calls. So when I saw that movement, I immediately assumed it could have been... Uh, his sister, but uh, as, I, as I just suddenly saw that sort of avian head pop through. So unfortunately all the leopards are in not the best spots to view them at the moment, except for Queen Karula, and I don't think that situation is going to change too much down here in the riverbed. So I think, let's go make sure before the end of show we've got a nice leopard out in the open, and of course it is a firm favourite, the Queen of Juba. that roundy roundy turny turny Aubrey. Aubrey is 18 years old and Aubrey would like to know, do I think leopards are nicer to their cubs than lions are? Uh, probably not, uh, Aubrey. You know, you've got to be tough to survive out here in the African bush and I think uh, the tough lessons dealt by the parents, or in particular with leopards, the mothers, you know, we don't want to fall into the hole, um, are very, very important. Uh, in having that cub survive because it is tough out here. You've got hyenas, you've got lions, you've got elephants, so you've got to be a little bit, have a bit of a mean streak in you to survive. Oh, gorilla's in the beautiful light. Let's get back to her. It's still napping, soaking up the morning rays. I'm quite happy the sun seems to have won the battle with the clouds. There we go. 
How's that? We've got... Hi, Joey. Joey's in Australia. And Joey would like to know, how many times have I successfully seen a leopard make a kill? And just tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, I, I probably lost count, <laughs> Joey. I've seen it quite a few times. Unfortunately, oopsie, sorry about that. Me and cables are just not the best friends. I managed to get them hooked over everything. Um, so, I probably, I, I've literally lost count. I think um, it's, it's an incredible thing to watch. They're such, such great camoufla uh, camouflage artists. And when they're stalking, the movements are almost, they move so slowly, it almost doesn't look like they're moving at all. Well, like Karula's doing now. Oh no, she's got an itchy. But, so Jay, and they, they, they are incredible. I've, I've, one of the most fascinating ones I've ever seen is I saw a leopard drop down from a tree and uh, grab a diker. Now that is very unusual. They normally do most of their hunting on the ground. It's quite dangerous to drop from high uh, onto an animal. You can injure yourself. And of course, any injury uh, could be very detrimental towards these big cats as it impedes their hunting prowess. Oh, I'm trying to think. I've seen them. I've seen leopard kill a lechwear a couple of times. I've actually seen it, a leopard drown a lechwear in the Okavango Delta. Caught it. Uh, and then held its head underwater in very shallow water. Uh, in very shallow water. Um, I've seen them catch warthogs. I've seen them catch kudu. Of course, impala, quite a few impala. I think one of the, another one of the strangest uh, kill, leopard kills I've ever seen actually was here on Juma, but it happened to be while we were off air, unfortunately. And we saw quarantine killer side striped jackal. That was, that was quite fascinating. The jackal was actually being chased by hyenas and ran straight into quarantine. And he killed it. He didn't manage to kill it, actually. He just bit it in the middle of its back. And then the hyenas arrived and chased him up a tree. And then that poor jackal, and that poor jackal was struggling and to, and to, to get up. It had a broken back and was making the most terrible distress calls. And then hyenas... Uh, rushed in and, and killed it, finished the job, and ate it. Oh, sleepy kitty. So I think it's going to be interesting to see on the Sunset Safari whether Karula decides to move off. or we're going to find them in the same area, because I'm 100% certain that there's going to be no... Oh, that fly on her nose. There's going to be no kill left to speak of. So whether she's going to move and take the cubs for a drink at one of the little water holes or pans around here, or is she going to hang around in this area and maybe only move a little bit later? So I'm very excited to see what's happening on the Sunset Safari, I think. Everything's calming down here. So we're gonna leave this area and leave the leopards to their slumber. And hopefully, I feel like some elephants on the way home. Now, Karula, please be kind. Don't move a muscle. Be, only start moving when we get back here uh, for the sunset safari. Okay. Oh, heads up. Heads down. <laughs> We're going to move out of the block now. Well, it has been an incredibly interesting morning. Uh, that Karula left the cubs very close to Tsingana while trying to hunt those in Pala, but she has come back. I'll just quickly go past the spot where she actually killed that impala. That, again, sorry about that. 
the door handle is my enemy today. Okay, so she killed that impala on this seep line. So the impala is like feeding in these areas. But she's got great cover on the edge. So to continue with what Joey was asking about is that The light's a bit bad from the side. There we go. So you see that little dark patch over there? And that one there. That's dried blood and feces that came out of that impala. Oh. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. And you can still there's a few flies around, but that's actually where she killed that impala. Isn't that absolutely amazing? So while we, oh, look there, look, look, there's a carrion beetle as well coming to eat the blood, scuttling about. Oh, it goes, feeling a bit self-conscious. So while we move out of this thicket, uh, we're going to go back to James, uh, who's on foot at quarantine. I am not in foot, everybody. I am in the sky, flying like a bird. Not really, I'm in a tree. Uh, a very small, scraggly little marula tree that I just felt like I should climb up. Now, we had a question about how many different kinds of trees there are in this area. Um, you're, it's from Kim Kim. Kim Kim, I suspect the number of tree species, if you were to count them all, for Juma would probably be about... 150 or so, but in the Kruger region, um, in the entire Kruger region, you'd probably find 900 or so different species of plants and shrub. And so, I'm just trying to think, uh, maybe about 200 around Juma, but there are lots of different habitats in the Kruger region and in Pumalanga and Limpopo, and so different kinds of habitats do spawn far different um, veg suites of vegetation than, for example, you would find a much greater variation in the vegetation than you would find perhaps in the animals. So I think that's probably how many there are in this area. I couldn't tell you for sure though. Right, we're going to say goodbye to you, I think. Now are we, Rebecca? We are. All right, we're going to say goodbye to you until this afternoon. So thank you very much for coming on our little bush walk with us. I think we've had a lovely time, haven't we, Jean-André? Jean-André is uh, looking morose, but that's just because that's what he's doing. Thank you, Herbert, for your efforts today, and a big thank you to the final control. We'll hand you over to Brent and the Leopards for the last few minutes of the drive, and we'll see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Bye-bye. So we're still uh, trying to extricate ourselves from the thickets here, and I think I've got a good way at following up that seep line that we went looking for Karula hunting on earlier. I just have to be on the game drive comms for a second. Ephraim, Ephraim. Uh, if uh, you make your way towards these ingwers. Okay, if our best access is from Mamba Road, um, I'll, you should see the Morvan Konzo. I'll drop a branch. Oh, there's a branch on the road. There's a weeping wattle. So the best view is of Karula. She's lying up on the northern side of the drainage. Uh, and then Tingana is eating the Nyama. And the Mampumpans are in the thickets on the southern side of the Mishkoga. Okay, there we go. Updates done. We are back on a road better travelled. And what an exciting morning it's been. I know I got sidetracked from my lion tracking when we spotted Karula stalking up a little, a, a little, little drainage system. And I'm really hoping they're going to be around. I'm pretty sure she's going to move either during the day, but I'm hoping she's going to wait till we get there on the sunset safari to sneak off. And fingers crossed everyone that she either goes north or west she mustn't go south or east. She is quite close to the southern and eastern boundary. 
And I wonder where those Inkahumas have got to. They must be around somewhere. So hopefully they'll make an appearance sometime during the day. Keep a look up on the dam cam during the day. You never know. They might miraculously appear. And uh, everyone must be nice to Zander. And he's, a try he's getting the grips on the cameras. It's very different shooting live from shooting uh, to shooting normal documentaries where you have time to level your tripod, take your time. And uh, whereas he here it's go, 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 go. And especially when he's got difficult characters like James and myself to deal with. Jamie is, of course, sweet and lovely. James and I are probably not. And, um, yeah, well, I'm sure Zander will get the ropes very quickly, but just bear with while he gets used to the live safaris. He's got good mentors in Viam and Genre, and of course, uh, Brian Joubert and the creature that controls him, the thumb, will be back today. So that's very exciting to have Brian coming back from his holiday. I'm sure he's going to be very well rested and in the most jovial of moods. And also, we're lucky enough to get Steph back. So, Dispatch is wondering, where do we live? Uh, well, we live at the DRC. And, of course, that is not the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is the Juma Research Camp. Uh, so, half our team, or a bit more than half our team, live there. And then a couple of us live at Inga's, which is one of the landowners. It's her private house on, um, on Juma, which is on the other side of quarantine from the DRC. But we, we have all our meals and, and meetings and, and all that type of stuff uh, at the DRC, where the majority of the crew lives. Uh, dispatch also like to know, what's it like living here? Well, I think it's quite wonderful and I think most of our crew would agree. Uh, we do love being out in the bush and we're extremely uh, part of that rare breed who really, really love their jobs. And we work with an incredible, incredibly passionate bunch of characters. And it's a really incredible social dynamic that we've got there because you could not have more different personalities and people. And somehow we all just seem to gel really well, which is great because we not only work together, we live together. There's no going, going, going home after work. Home and work are one and the same. Oh, hello. We got some lovely kudus, and female kudus, and off they go. Made this moving around now that it's a bit warmer. Uh, Going to head towards the crests and start feeding on all the different leaves. But from Viam Zunder and myself here on the rust bucket and the rest of the safari live crew it's been a wonderful having you on the sunrise safari with us and i'm sure james has kept kept you up to up up in stitches uh, climbing trees termite mounds seeing elephants on foot and we were incredibly lucky to spend almost our entire drive with the incredible leopards of the juma private game reserve and I'm definitely going to try and make my way back there on the Sunset Safari. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that dynamic plays out. Hopefully as well, as I said a bit earlier, the Nkuma Pride uh, makes another appearance. And the clouds have been beaten away by the sunshine, which puts a smile on my dial. And uh, I'm looking forward to a cup of coffee and getting ready to do it again in a few short hours on the Sunset Safari. So a toodaloo.